Camino Aguadito. Okay, it is a uh, the teachers have not had a contact all the years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the oh, right on. Teachers, happy students, all you It's cute. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah.
a deficit of two million dollars plus. Actually, over those five years, the district has budgeted a ten point three million dollar deficit. But the reality is, they had three million dollars surplus in the general fund. That's a thirteen million dollar miss. And they'll try to pretend that it's one-time money or this or that, but the bottom line is, the bottom line, the bottom line is, they, they have missed that budget for that $2 million. At a time they've been asking us to make sacrifices, but even beyond the money, it's respect. And being told that we don't work hard enough and when we know and our students know the work that we do, um, being told that budget problems that turned out never to exist are our fault. None of that builds a sense of <laughs> also, over this time period, our shared governance process, which is a process that goes back to the Middle Ages, where faculty participate in governance as part of education. That has been undermined in a number of different ways, and we're told we have our role, and we're not supposed to um, step out of that role. And that might be okay if the administration was doing a good job of managing the budget, of, of, um, yeah, of serving, of, of uh, managing enrollment, and so on. But obviously, given our accreditation situation, they're not. So, how, how, did, how do you think they were so far off on the budget? And then where... I think it was intentional. I think they, they overestimated expenses, number one. Number two, we have a health insurance plan that is self-funded. So at the beginning of the year, they put money into that fund. That money is ongoing money. It comes from the general fund. But then, at the end of the year, they'll take money out of it and say, it's one-time money. Suddenly it's changed. No, it was ongoing money to begin with. So that was part of it, is they've moved money around in ways that were confusing. And I think the reason they did it was to create the impression that we had a budget crisis to force faculty to make even greater concessions than we have. And to make concessions that ultimately we believe will hurt students. Well, the numbers don't lie, and the history doesn't lie. You have, a, you have a faculty union that has gone out of its way to work with the district and the administration. And since we've had a new president, he's gotten a contract extension, but our faculty have not. We've gone, we're now entering our fifth year without a contract, and the only raises we've gotten have been contractually required we had to go to mediation, and we basic and we accepted less than we were owed. That's not a raise; that's a debt. They owed us money, and then they paid us less, and then they paid it after the fact. Yeah, yeah. Try doing that with a bank. Yeah. So, I mean, would it have shown up, like, if someone like me who has yeah. struggles understanding budgets, but? If I went back and looked at all the I budgets show that you. are listed on the website, for example. Yes, I can you show can you. Find you. I can show you literally in one minute it'll be clear as day to you wow. that there has not been a deficit in actuality. The thing is, they make a big deal out of the budgeted structural deficit that they adopt in June, but when the actuals are reported in November, it's like a whisper. And there's never any comments on what the actual really are. So that, there's a desire to transform the college, to make it more like other colleges, um, and to undermine, the, uh, to, to basically take time that faculty now are compensated for to work with students and take that away. So uh, when I'm doing, I've been doing research.
research on sort of the whole community college system and mm -hmm. it looks like the state is pretty much trying to push community colleges toward more vocational, that sort of thing. I mean, this has the, nothing to do with that. That is the line they have been using. That is true. Yeah. That is true. So, but my question is, as you said, trying to make it like more like other colleges. Well, right. Maybe just explain to me, what do you mean other by making it more like other colleges? A larger administration. Okay. And um, less time for faculty to do the work of preparing for classes and provide student feedback. Basically, looking at students as numbers, how many students in this course section? You know, how many students in this program? Oh, if it doesn't meet this number, it's gone. If it does meet this number, great. So, kind of basically running the college. Um, business-like, which sounds good in principle, but we are not a business or community college. Um, we nurture and teach. It's a different model. Hello, oh, it's Henry. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm going to let you go back to the, okay. you. Okay. I'm definitely going to call you. Yeah, you and I'd like questions. to show you the budget numbers. Yeah. Yeah, you'll like, see it clear as day. That would be now, they'll try to pretend that it's one time money or this or that, but they've never actually shown it. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and okay. we've asked for it many times. We asked for the state to come in and do a fiscal um, audit, yeah. and they refuse to do that. Yeah. So that tells you something, too. So what is the difference, because I'm, I'm just starting to read the um, what, the brain uh, report. Sure. Mm -hmm. What did you think of that report, by the way? Well, the college administration got what they paid for. <laughs> they paid them a lot of money to tell them what they wanted to hear, which is what we said in the first place, what was why they should bring in the state. The state agency is going to look at it with um, fresh eyes that are not biased based on who's paying them. And so they did an operational audit. They said, hey, look at faculty and compare the work and how they do their work and how they're compensated to other community colleges. Look for ways to make them teach more students uh, no matter what no matter what the impact on student learning. And that's what they did. But they, they didn't uh, look at the budget. They didn't look at these most basic things. Is there a structural deficit? How do we spend our money compared to other colleges? They didn't look at that. Wow. That's what they should have looked at. That's what we asked for. Okay, interesting. And who would have done that from the state? It's called FCMAT. It's called the Fiscal Crisis management team. And is there a way, I mean, can only the administration bring that in? Is there a way to bring them in? Is there a way for the state to... No, well, if the board were to ask, it would take, it would require, as far as I understand it, it would require an act of the board. And, and you've already seen where the board lies, where their right. allegiance is lies. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I'll definitely we'll see you more later. Yeah. Yep. Great. Thanks. Um, our photographer's on his way. Okay. So he's going to take photos. Who else would be good to talk to? Um, what, Anthony? Uh, in the or the guy next to him who would be good? Yeah, man. That's how, uh, uh, yeah, we took it. Yeah, yeah, we met him. We have to share some materials. Are you alright? Yeah, let's do the same. 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 Sixth year at NBC. Where did you and, come from? Well, I've been at Gavlin 
and then UCSC for a bunch of years. I was a high school teacher before that in the Bay Area, Bajo Valley. So I've been in Bay Area education for 20 years. And I've been following these um, questions of funding and administration for a good 20 years. So I can tell you a lot about the rise of administration if you'd like to hear about. Yeah. For example, the UC system at this point has more administrators than faculty. Uh, faculty has grown sometimes at rates five times that of full-time faculty. I mean, administration has grown at rates often five times that of full-time faculty. You will notice at the NBC campus we had a limited number of full-time hires over the last, say, 20 years while the rate of administrative hires is increasing. Uh, we're heavily relying on, on adjunct labor, and adjuncts on this campus are paid among the lowest in the entire state, and the absolute lowest for any school that's similar in terms of the cost of living. Um, you're probably in violation of the sort of uh, ratio rule about how many part-times you can have, and one of the ways that administration skirt that rule is by saying that if you look at the campus as a whole, we're in compliance, but you'll have divisions that are out of compliance where they're over-relying on part-time labor, which is a violation of the state's goal of having, uh, let's say, a two-third balance, and you're going to have to look up that. Okay, it's an 80-20, but... Um, so, so wait, how do they skirt that? They skirt that by, by, for example, there'll be divisions like perhaps English that has a, no, a lot of full-time people. And they'll use that number to sort of ignore the fact that uh, ADMJ has no full-time people. Or that, say, um, uh, sociology, I have to rely on sometimes five adjuncts, and I'm the only full-time person. So they, you know, they'll say that the campus as a whole supposedly, supposedly is within balance. But if you look more closely, you'll see that some divisions are really suffering with an uh, overwhelming number of part-time labor. Uh, and you've got to understand how little these people are paid. I mean, our pay right now is is literally half of what they can get in other places in the Bay Area. Um, and, you know, they're teaching at two and three schools. You heard the idea of the freeway fly, right? Yes. So, I think our, our, our main issue to start this year is that we want a contract. We've been out of contract for four years. We want to maintain our health care benefits. They keep sort of trying to attack our health care benefits and claim that, you know, it's it's costing them. And in fact, our health care is one of the cheaper plans. It's, it's actually saving the campus money over the last decade compared to some other colleges. Um, they are making the false claim that we work less than instructors on the campus, and I, and I would I would ask anyone to come in independently and look at the work rates of people on this campus. We work as hard as instructors at any campus. There's simply no way that that's true. It's it's partly a misunderstanding of what we call release time. Some instructors who teach heavy loads and, and instructors who have heavy grading rates will get a certain kind of release and a certain kind of grading factor, but that's simply so that they can do their jobs well. And if you go and, and go and talk to those instructors, you'll find that they are still working at night, still working at weekends. There is not an instructor on this campus that is getting away with some kind of reduced work rate. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a kind of uh, lie that they're promoting to, to try to justify why we're paying someone. I've heard you stop since say that. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just... Why do you think that idea got in there for you? I, why does it persist? Okay, I, best case scenario is that they simply are ignorant of the facts of how we work on this campus, and I would invite them to come in and, 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 and shadow some instructors. And the instructors that I know, and I, and I know most of them are grading at night and grading on weekends and taking work home, and it's a job that never ends. And they're answering emails at night, and they're meeting with students in their off hours, oftentimes staying here well beyond what the contract might require. I would invite them to come in and see that. That's best case scenario. I think worst case scenario, those groups at the top, administration, in a self-serving way, continues to manufacture a narrative which justifies their expansion. Okay, and justifies their attacks on our pay and cuts to our health care and cuts to classes. And I think that's a sort of worst case scenario. So they're either nefarious and they know exactly what they're doing in order to justify their expansion, or they're simply ignorant and they need to come out of their offices and come down and see what is their actually doing. And then they'll get What is their, I guess, what is their motivation? I would argue, so statewide, uh, talk to CTA, like maybe go up the chain and talk to some CTA reps at the, at the state level. I go to those meetings three times a year. CTA 
EPA is looking at what's happening on all community college right. campuses. And the, and the general trend is that administration, because of their structural position, becomes self-serving. If you're an administrator, you want to reduce your workload. You want to get paid more. Every time these presidents go from school to school, and you see that pattern, they often bounce from school to school every two to three years. Every time they do that, their pay goes up, their benefit packages go up. So there's a very strong interest built into the administrative mechanism for them to continue to behave in those ways. So even good people, I think, when put into that sort of position, start realizing, oh, if I if I quit this school and rush off to Yuba City or something, you know, I'm going to get a fifty thousand dollar pay increase and I'll retire better. You know, so there's a constant kind of cavalcade of administrators coming and going. In terms of why they want to increase their numbers, it has to do with control. You know, the, we have a shared governance campus, and that's hard for some people. To, to negotiate and to cooperate and have to listen to instructors' goals and instructors' desires. They would like a system in which they are able to just mandate policy all the time. And that's not the kind of campus I want to work at, right? Um, we believe that faculty best know how to serve students. We know that faculty best understand their disciplines. And so to have an administrator or a dean come in and start dis making decisions about, say, class offerings or how many, you know, here's one of my favorites. Their main goal is to increase class size because that increases, increases revenue, cuts costs because you can fill up adjunct instructor's class with 50 people, okay? But that's not good for students, right? And that's not good for adjunct instructors who are already teaching multiple classes at multiple schools and now you've doubled their grading load and you've made it more difficult to have a good class. I often say it's a warm butts and seats model, right? What they care about is numbers of students present in the classroom, driving revenue up, cutting costs by employing lowly paid adjuncts. That's their kind of guiding mechanism. Our guiding mechanism is that we care about students as human beings, right? We care about students and their lives outside of this school and where they're going to go after this school and what kind of preparation we can give them in the 16 weeks that we have with them, right? It's not just a number for me sitting there like a, 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 a okay? So that is the primary battle. I mean, it's about salary and it's about our benefits, but it's also about what kind of classroom conditions are we going to have for students at the end of the day. If you listen to the goals of administration, you'll see that they're pushing us down a path of increased um, administrative overreach, right? A kind of a kind of trip, tripling of administrative numbers. I mean, they're talking about hiring 16 new teams, and and you have to really dig deep to explain to you why. That are 16 people that are going to basically sit around and, and mostly push paper and give orders, right? Instructors know how to do their jobs. I don't need to be um, lorded over by some kind of uh, parental figure. See, I mean, I'm a professional. I have multiple master's degree. Point to any other profession who has an educational level that I do and show me that they're having to live under kind of a management team that's telling them what to do. Not doctors, not lawyers, not social workers, not nurses, right? Nobody is put under the kind of administrative uh, pressure that instructors are. And you see it at the K-12 through level, and you see it at the, at the college level. And so I think part of it is about who is going to push this campus in what kinds of directions, right? And we're here really standing up for students, and we want, you know, we want to maintain small class sizes. We want to maintain classes that are sometimes very small. You know, administration won't let a class go if it has less than 15. But what if this is a ceramics class that only has eight students? Should those eight students not be able to learn ceramics this semester? You know, and historically, if you have an English class of 50 or some science class of 75, that class would carry the class of eight, right? Because now you're talking about a, if you've got a class of 75 and a class of, of, of eight, right? We're still talking about an average that's close to what? 40, right? And so our magic number on this campus, if you consider the cost of adjunct labor, is probably only about a, a 12. But they're constantly screaming that we have to have 15 to pay the bills. And that's a simplification of reality. Yes, we have to have a 15 average maybe across the campus. Okay, and it's probably lower again if you consider adjunct costs. They don't fact, they, they're talking about a full-time salary. So it's probably lower than 15. But let's even give them that. Let's say we have to have 15 on this campus. The, cla the classroom average is almost always above that. We don't have many classes that come below 15, but we should be able to keep them classes of 10 and 11 and 12 if there's other classes on this campus that have 70 and 16 and 50. Right? And that's something that they're starting to, to, to completely rip out from under us. And so you go talk to the art department who's having trouble uh, keeping classes alive because you don't have 50 students that want ceramics and you never will. 
and you're not going to, and you can't teach ceramics effectively. <laughs> ceramics students need close and personal attention with the master artist. They don't need a room full of 50. It's not a lecture class, right? So I think there's a fundamental disjuncture between what we want in terms of what's best for students and best for education and what they want in terms of uh, cutting costs and raising revenue, you know, just driven by a really uh, ruthless bottom line ethic. And so the... the Sorry, can you yeah, say that again? Yeah. What we want is a kind of student-centered, uh, lear you know, learning conditions focused approach to this campus that benefits students and their learning goals and, and our teaching goals, not a campus that's driven by a sort of ruthless bottom line ethic which makes every decision based on, um, you know, this notion of revenue and, and cost, right? <laughs> and they're going to, and I'll tell you what their story is going to be, they're going to mumble about how our, our enrollment is not good. That is a fabrication. Our enrollment's been consistently good for a decade. We, you know, they're going to talk about we lost the, the non-credit stuff, you know. But that, that's not, it's kind of a, what we call like a false flag. Because we're not dependent on that revenue, right? That revenue is gone, but we're not even talking about that. We're talking about how many full-time students do we have, and what can that pay for? And if you notice, they've been manufacturing a story of a two million dollar deficit for all six years. That was a consistent story. Two million dollar deficit. Two million dollar deficit. Lo and behold, when we finally got clear numbers this year, now they're simply saying, "Oh no, there's no deficit." The point is, there never was a deficit. If you add up the mismanagement of money over that six-year period, there's a thirteen million dollar surplus in total. You know, some years we were ending up with a million extra, 800,000 extra, and Alan Hoffa can give you more details on that, but yeah, the, the budget, you know, so that, you know, I think that's a key way to understand that this, the counter story, you know, their story is a story of the sky is falling, you've got to cut, 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 right? Our story is about um, the growth of community and what's best for a community college in terms of serving the needs of all the kinds of students that want to come here. And you'll notice that um, when you get to, to that econometric lens where it's all about cost, 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 and bottom line, bottom line, you start to cut the arts because that's the, first, that's the first thing to go because their classes are not big. And you start to cut the theater, which is not a, a huge money maker in the way that uh, uh, the STEM fields are or maybe the business program or some of these, you know, uh, cash cows that we have. You know, I'm fortunate to be in the social sciences where we have huge enrollment, so we're mostly never under these threats. But I really feel for my colleagues who are struggling to keep courses alive and, and keep programs alive. So, yeah. Explain to me why the um, enrollment thing is a false flag. It's, it's, a, it's a false flag because... Isn't that yeah. straight numbers? It is straight numbers, but, our, but so it's a false flag because our... Our students that primarily pay the, pay the bills, full time students, are, have actually been consistent for the decade that they keep throwing money to. There was a hit that all the state took at a certain point when there was a decline having to deal with the economics realities of our state or whatever, but I, I think that you just have to look at our reality as not much different than other community colleges, Hart now, Gavilan, right? They've had the similar kinds of changes that we've had, and yet they've been able to pay their instructors much, uh, much better. They have been able to hold on to classes. So I think, um, you know, the quickest way to understand the false flag idea is that they keep talking about the idea that we lost, which happened a long time ago. They keep bringing up the idea of repeatability you know, being taken from us. That happened to every college in the state. So, you know, yes, some of the, there's some truth in some of those claims that it's a tougher market for community colleges now. There's more educational options for students, right? Um, there's increased pressures put on us because we have to both transfer students to the CSU and the UC, and we have to serve these sort of lifelong learners and the students that are in the All of those things have a grain of truth in them. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to can we run this college in a way that pays teachers well and serves students best. And that's not the direction that we're taking. I'm sorry, can, so can, we, can we run this college in a way that, that serves students best and pays instructors well, right? Pays them commensurate with the cost of living in this county. And what they keep claiming is that that's not possible. That if we want to be paid adequately, we're going to have to take cuts and we're going to have to use our health care. And those two things are uh, it's a false, you know, sort of a it's a, it's a, uh, you know, it's not either or. What we'd like to see is a sort of yes and. Yes, we're going to make changes that are necessary for the health of the college. And, you know, we, you, you have to look back. We've taken pay cuts in the past. We, uh, you know, they agreed to cut classes in the past. We've done those kinds of things. 
but at a certain point, yeah, but I think that's a, you know, uh, a disastrous direction. Like how much can be cut if the budget still has to cut by some place? Uh, what else have I not told you? I think you kind of understand the budgetary issue, the pay, the class size issue, the robots and seats. I, I think the other one is about, um, again, instructor autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, we have academic freedom. A guaranteed by, by frankly, the Constitution and state, state policies around education and federal policies. And the way that they're pushing an administrative model of oversight is, it, is, is increasingly squeezing us into a kind of accountability model, which is stripping away some of our agency. We're being asked to do a, a much greater level of record keeping to comply with, uh, partly with the ACCJC accreditation. But you should really look into the ways that the ACCJC has been found by the state of California to be a rogue organization that they no longer have uh, uh, confidence in. The state actually wants to come up with other accrediting agencies. So we've still got this ACCJC. It's the only group we have, and we have to sort of submit to their uh, will. But if you look at the way they've behaved, the ACCJC as a group, the way they behaved at San Francisco City College, the way they behaved, the way they behaved at some other colleges that they put on probation, they're often pushing this model of um, increasing administration, uh, stripping away faculty power and academic freedom, and really forcing us into kinds of record keeping that's not helpful, uh, has not been shown to be. There's no, there's no long-term research that says me writing these SLOs helps my students. Now, a lot of us are complying. I want to say that a lot of us are happy to show what we do. We are we're happy with being transparent and talking about the ways that we try to improve our classes and improve our assignments and improve our, uh, our lessons. Okay. At the same time, we are many of us are upset at the ways that we're being um, monitored by our colleagues. It really is a conflict of interest. Our colleagues are not supposed to be monitoring us. That's a job of administrators, a job of deans. We're being told to look at the ways that other instructors are assessing and then, um, you know, in some ways we're being forced to comply with a small group called the Learning Assessment Committee, which has been given power why, who, why, you know, it's a violation of the traditional ways that we assess our own classes. A lot of old-timers will tell you that good instructors are always improving. We do it inherently every time we teach. I say to myself, did that class go well today? What worked, what didn't work? We do that almost unconsciously. I don't need to sit and write about that day after day after day to, to show somebody else that I do that. Now, what they're asking for is that I track my students' scores on tests. Right? Many of us already do that. They're asking us to track their performance on papers. Most of us already do that. We say to ourselves every semester, did students do well on that paper? What can I do to better teach that, that essay? What can I do to better give them skills? So there's a, there's a bit of a conflict there. We have, you, 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 you have to look into the fact that our union did agree to, to do those SLOs, to put them as a part of our um, professional growth and our sort of um, performance set, you know, ratings. And so, I think that everywhere you look on this campus, you'll see a tension between those two visions. A vision of, are we doing what's best for uh, students and instruction and teaching and learning? Is that our driving ethic? Are we always looking at what students need, what the community needs? Or are we constantly being pushed back towards what we might call a kind of econometrics, a technocratic vision of efficiency? And every time they use that word efficiency, you really have to ask, what do you mean by efficiency in the context of an educational institution? Right? We are not robots. This is not a factory. We're not pumping out cars. Right? It's not Toyota. Right? We're, these, my students are not raw materials to be worked on. It's a classic uh, 60s line where Mario Savio protested at Berkeley. Steps of Sproul Hall, he screamed that we, the students of, of, of Berkeley, are not the raw materials and our instructors are not factory workers crushing us into some form. Right? What we're about here is, is the freedom of ideas. We're about the passion of learning. We're about the growth and transformative effects of education on human people's lives. That's not something that can be. Uh, can you go back? Yeah. So I want yeah. to catch up. You said, what we're about here is. Uh, <laughs> 
We're about freedom of ideas, freedom of ideas right? Um, freedom of uh, you know academic freedom, uh, the, you know, sort of educational rights of students to have access to an open and democratic educational experience. The transformative power of education. That's what that's what I would say. And that is always in conflict with this business model, which says we're about efficiency and, and money and numbers. Because I think you have to really ask yourself a deeper question. You know, can we measure numerically the effect of education on students? In many cases, that education comes into play a year after they leave us, two years after they leave us. They think back and they say, oh my God, that anthropology class I took that talked to me about human behavior. Now I get it, right? Because I'm looking at humans and I'm watching. You can't measure that growth. And, and so to think that we can sort of, to think that we can reduce everything to these numbers is, is highly problematic. And that's part of what we're fighting. I don't want to be told every day how efficient I am in terms of my class sizes. You know, I work hard to attract students. My numbers are pretty good. But I don't want to squeeze 60 people into a room. Because my teaching is about knowing them face to face and getting to know them over the course of the semester and understanding them as human beings outside of my class. What kind of life do you live? Where do you work? What are your hobbies? What is your family like? I can't do that with 60 people. Yeah. You know? But aren't and, and so there aren't many instructors that want to go down that path of just, you know, triple my class size so we can sort of make money. But aren't you kind of running up against a whole trend? Because that's kind of the trend I see. Because yeah, I do the yeah. research about the state. Yeah. That's kind of the trend. Well, it has been. I mean, you see classes so are, yeah. yeah. We're trying to fighting fight something yeah, that's bigger than you. Yeah, we are fighting. I mean, at the, at the school level, we're fighting administrative decisions, which we consider to be bad for students and teachers. You know, in a larger scale, maybe our work here is has implications for other campuses, certainly, that we're resisting. Hey, good to see you. Um, we are resisting a kind of model that's been pushed on other places, certainly. If you look at what's happened at the UCs now, which used to be sort of the most wonderful institutions in the world, you now have undergraduates taking classes with 600 you know, students and most work at the UCs is now being done by adjuncts mm -hmm. and part-time graduate students. So that, in that sense, we are fighting a battle that's bigger than us, just like teachers in Chicago and New Orleans and, and San Francisco, right? So it is a fight that's everywhere. I think the particular, uh, you know, the, the sort of particulars of ours really come down to, to our adjunct pay in particular, because our adjunct pay is the lowest almost the lowest in the entire state and it's a very high cost of living. Right? So we can't, you know, those of us who are full-time and relatively comfortable, we can't in good conscience ignore the fact that most of my colleagues are barely able to survive in this county. I have in fact lost three instructors in sociology because they couldn't afford to stay here. They had to move. They had to move to places like Bakersfield. One went to Texas to be back by her family. Um, you're literally driving part-time teachers out of this school because of the low pay. And, and then I always want to take it back down to, to the experience of students. So if you think about instructors are leaving, instructors are working at three campuses at the same time, they have no office space, they have no health benefits, so students suffer. Because now you have an instructor who's more uh, frantic. You have an instructor who has to rush off to Hartnell after their class ends. You have an instructor who gets sick more often, right? You have an instructor who's under emotional duress all the time because they're not sure how to pay the rent. Those are how real effects on students' experience. They don't get a happy, well-paid, well-rested full-time instructor. They get a person who, quite frankly, is under the stress of having to drive back and forth to three campuses all the time. That's a very different experience. And I think when students hear about that, they're often outraged. They love their instructors. They believe that their instructors deserve a decent contract and fair pay. And so if you think about the, the sort of moral high ground in this fight, it's clearly on the side of students and teachers. You're going to have a hard time finding anybody in our service area that's going to say, oh, we love administrator salaries. And we love administrator cell phone budgets and travel budgets and you know, uh, increasing their numbers. There's nobody out there saying that. What people in this community say is we, we love teachers, we love the way they take care of our kids. I get it all the time when I go to area cafes and I see parents of students sometimes and I see co-workers who've had kids in my class. They always thank us for getting to know their child. That we didn't treat them as just some number passing through that I actually knew Jackson's name. That I actually knew Alice's name, right? And had something 
uh, a connection with them that's on a deeper level. So that is probably all I can give you. If you have other specific questions, I'd love to answer them. And I'm happy to Kendra, what you, what, in your mind, what's the most important thing about the classroom and teachers and learning? Uh, that you're not me or me, Right? <laughs> Got it. All right, thank you. Get Alan. I'll get everybody. Everybody. Oh, good thing we didn't just go. Really? Yeah. 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 Section corners. We are. Well, so far the cops haven't come here. I don't think they will. No, well, you're you're pretty well contained on the sidewalk. What are you doing? I mean, they could tell you you got to move. If they want to be able about it, they can tell you that. But I don't think they would do that. Well, yeah. Well, the police are pretty chill.
That's what I need. Huh? An air horn. That'll give you the horn. I know, right? Yeah, there you go. That's kind of abrasive, though. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it might actually violate the noise pool when you see the city. Oh, he's back? Oh, <laughs> Yeah, it'll be nice. Oh, it's good. It'll go. Yeah. Exactly. That was kind of fun. <laughs> 